The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Today's session is CPOE, CDS, and Health IT Safety. Just a, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions for the panelists, please type your question into the question panel at the lower right of your screen. Uh, because of the number of attendees, all phone lines are muted. Um, but the uh, presenters will take questions uh, after each uh, presentation. If you want to close captioning for today's session, that information is provided at www.captionedtext.com. Uh, the slides and audio for this session will be posted within two weeks at healthitsafety.org. Please go to that site if you have any questions about the webinar series. And now I'd like to turn the session over to Dr. Jonathan Wald. John? Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, well, welcome, everybody, to our session today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wald. I am a, a physician informaticist at RTI, and, um, and, and we are uh, putting this webinar series together uh, for the ONC. It's a series of 10 webinars that are focused on health IT and patient safety, and they're happening monthly. Uh, this is the sixth, uh, sorry, the fifth one, and they'll be happening through September of this year. Um, these webinars are funded by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, um, and RTI is a nonprofit research organization, and we're doing this as part of a year-long project to develop a roadmap for, health IT, for a health IT safety center. Um, under contract from the ONC. If you want any additional information about the project or about the webinar series, uh, that's available at www.healthitsafety.org. Next slide, please. So um, just to get us uh, started, today's presentations um, will be by David Klassen. Uh, who's the Chief Medical Information Officer for Pascal Metrics and is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah, um, and David Bates, Chief Innovation Officer and Senior Vice President at Brigham's Women's Hospital and, and the Chief for the Division of General Internal Medicine at Brigham and Women, and he also is the Medical Director of Clinical and Quality Analysis for Partners Healthcare. And moderating our session is Barry Blumenfeld. Uh, Barry is a Senior Physician Informaticist at RTI in the Center for the Advancement of Health IT. And I'd like to turn things over now to Barry. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And could I have the next slide, please? I uh, want to thank you for dialing in today. I guess I wish you either a good afternoon or a good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Klassen. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Glasson, he is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Utah and conducts patient safety research at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Dr. Glasson was a co-developer of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, its global trigger tool. He was a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that developed the National Healthcare Quality Report and was also a member of the IOM Committee on Patient Safety Data Standards as well as the IOM Committee on Health IT and Patient Safety. Dr. Klassen is an advisor to the LeapFrog Group and has developed and implemented the CPOE EMR flight simulator for the LeapFrog Group and National Quality Forum, which has been funded and overseen by the AHRQ. He is a board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. And it, the uh, um, section that he'll be presenting today is on optimizing the patient safety impact of operational EHRs. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand off to Dr. Klassen, and uh, it's all yours, Dave. Great. Thanks very much, and welcome, everybody. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. And uh, we're going to have a two-part presentation. I'm going to present first on op optimizing patient safety and impact of operational EHRs, and then David Bates is going to present on CPOE and clinical decision support. And our presentations are related. Both David and I have been very involved uh, in developing ways to measure the safety of EHRs in actual use. Uh, 
and both of us have recently gotten an ARC uh, funded five year grant to further develop the tool I'm going to be talking about. So why don't we move on to the next slide if we can. And I think in the era of uh, the health information technology broad adoption, I think we all believe that we have improved the safety of care, and I think we have. But there's still uh, opportunities for further improvement. So I just want to tell two stories uh, uh, that recently occurred in the era of broad adoption of HIT. The first one was a 69-year-old woman admitted for collective colonic resection for diverticuli. And two days uh, after a normal operation, she developed pneumonia and went to the ICU. On the second day in the ICU, she suffered a very prolonged period of unrecognized hypotension. I was ultimately found to be septic and then died. Uh, on review of the case, it turned out that uh, her bedside monitor EHR interface had malfunctioned and uh, her blood pressure had been normal in the EHR. Next slide, please. Uh, another case, a very tragic case of a 27-year-old woman admitted to the ER with severe lower abdominal pain in the hospital was fully electronic, both inpatient and out with an EMR. Um, and she was evaluated and felt to have an acute abdomen. And they reviewed all of her EHR records. Um, and she was taken to a surgery. At surgery, she found to be pregnant and the fetus did not survive. On review of the case, uh, turned out to be a problem with interoperability in the sense that another patient's lower abdominal ultrasound report had been inadvertently inserted to her record and had been used by her doctors to exclude the uh, 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 diagnosis of pregnancy for her symptoms. Very tragic cases, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, much of which uh, are summarized in a report we put out um, from the Institute of Medicine on Health IT and Patient Safety that evaluated where we are in safety and what the opportunity to further leverage IT would be uh, uh, to improve uh, the safety of care we deliver. And one of the key parts of that uh, IOM report was to update us since two errors human in 1999. Where are we with respect to safety? Are we getting safer? Are we less safe than uh, two errors human was suggested? and we might have 98,000 deaths a year. Next slide. And in that report, we uh, basically identified a number of studies that suggested that we're not far to the right here on this curve, where we might think we are based on joint commission sentinel event reports, suggest that we're a pretty ultra-safe industry. We're probably far to the left here, uh, based on work from the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement Global Trigger Tool, which suggests that we may have harm in almost half the patients that we admit to the hospital. Next slide, please. And indeed, uh, one of the studies we cited uh, in this IOM report on where we are in safety was one done in the Medicare population by the Office of the Inspector General. Next slide. And that study looked at um, uh, about 780 uh, discharges from October 2008 in the Medicare population and applied uh, the IHI Global Trigger Tool approach to detect harm and found, next slide please, found that about 27% of the patients, Medicare patients, uh, reviewed developed adverse events during their hospitalization. And as you can see, only a small fraction of them were Medicare hospital-acquired events, and an even smaller fraction were reportable events. Next slide. Using the same methodology, another report we cited in this IOM report was a study done at three exemplary hospitals had full EMRs in place. And we asked the same question, what's the rate of harm? We brought external reviewers in, much like the OIG did. And we found rates of harm in these three hospitals of uh, almost uh, a third of patients. So these were the best of best, fully enabled um, EHR hospitals, still having pretty high rates of harm. Next slide. And unfortunately, um, those rates of harm, as you can see here, a total of uh, uh, 354 events were found through the IHI Global Trigger Tool. Only 35 were found through the ARC Patient Safety Indicators, which are part of CMS's new measure for the HACC program. And only four were found by volunteer reporting. So a whole lot of harm going on, even in EHR-enabled hospitals, and most of it being missed by our current detection approaches. Next slide. So uh, that led us uh, at this IOM committee to make a number of recommendations to say that we really do need to get a better job of leveraging health IT to improve our measurement and our improvement of safety. Next slide. And one of the recommendations we made is that ARC should fund the development of new measures for measuring the impact of health IT on safety using data from EHRs. So 
So why aren't we leveraging EHRs to actually measure safety? That was one of our major recommendations. Next slide. The other recommendation had to do with more effectively using health IT to prevent safety problems um, uh, rather than just measuring it. And David's going to talk much about this article, so let's skip to the next slide. And clearly there's evidence, as David will say, that, that, um, that HIT can actually worsen safety. Next slide. But one of the things we focused on our IM report was the other side of the coin, which is, are we doing enough with health IT to prevent safety problems? And here was a study that came from a hospital that's completely computerized from CPOE all the way to barcoding and pharmacy dispensing and still had a very high rate of adverse uh, drug events, which uh, CPOE and all of the computerization should have stopped. Next slide. And I think that led us to make a recommendation in the uh, uh, IOM report that uh, ONC and ARC should work with health IT vendors and healthcare organizations to begin to develop post-deployment safety testing of EHRs to make sure in actual operations they actually are doing the safety things we expect them to do. And uh, next slide. And we view this as a shared responsibility. Um, uh, much like in the aviation industry when the safe operation, safe flying is dependent on both um, Boeing producing a safe plane and United Airlines flying it safely, we think that's the approach that you go on in healthcare as well. Next slide. And one of the best examples of that is the safer guides that have been recently produced by the Office of the National Coordinator. Next slide. And they cover many aspects of back up, yeah, they cover many aspects of how we can improve the uh, uh, safety of our care with our EHR systems. Uh, one of the guides is on computerized order entry, and it strongly suggests that organizations do post-deployment of testing of their operational EHRs for safety. Next slide. And it turns out this is already uh, included in an NQF endorsed safe practice around computerized physician order entry. Next slide. And that safe practice says not only should hospitals do certain things when they implement CPOE, but they should also test it um, on an ongoing basis with a tool that David and I both developed about 10 years ago uh, and have just gotten funding to enhance, uh, currently administered by LeapFrog. Next slide. We call this tool the ARC EHR Flight Simulator, and it basically simulates uh, the operational safety performance of EHRs in, uh, in actual use. Next slide. And uh, this particular tool was developed about 10 years ago, and it focused on targeting the harm. We focused on actual adverse events that could be prevented, not just errors. We focused on encouraging quality improvement. Um, next slide. And David published a paper where he studied the ability of this tool to predict actual rates of harm in hospitals and found a correlation between actual rates of harm in hospitals and how the hospitals performed on this test. So I, I, it's a wonderful study that validates the test as predicting what uh, your rates of harm will be. And uh, next slide. And uh, what it reflected is the fact that when we built the test, we built it to focus on harm, not error. So we were really interested in focusing on things yeah, that the EHR could do which prevent actual harm to patients. We were fortunate enough to have multiple databases where people had linked harm to patients all the way back to the order in the EMR. And so based on that, we're able to build a test that actually evaluates operational EMRs for their ability to prevent safety problems. Next slide. And this is a web-enabled uh, test. Last year, more than 1,000 hospitals in the United States took it. Next slide. And this is simply the way it works. We use simulated cases um, that are entered into an operational EHR. Uh, and each of these simulated cases has some serious problem. We, we look to see if the EHR actually picks it up. So in this case, it would be a patient who's 52 years old, weighs 60 kilograms, allergic to morphine, has a normal creatinine, and we ask an order to be placed on that patient for Coumadin 5 milligrams three times a day, clearly an overdose, and we look to see whether the uh, operational EHR system picks this up. And one would assume, well, of course it does, but in actual operation, we find a high degree of variance from that idea. Next slide. And uh, we have developed an ambulatory version of the test. It hasn't been released yet. 
Um, next slide. And so here's how this web-enabled test works. Hospitals log on through the Leap Pride website, get access to a sample test, which they take uh, to understand how the test works. And then they take their real test, uh, both uh, initially starting with using uh, 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 patient scenarios and then order scenarios linked to them. Um, and I'll just show you in the quick screens to follow how this works. Next slide. So organizations sign into the LeapFrog website and get access to the test. You have to decide whether they're taking inpatient, adult, or pediatric. Next slide. And then they get a series of randomly selected uh, patient scenarios from a large database we've created. Um, and these scenarios include the information that you see in front of you. Next slide. And they're asked to enter them into their system, usually up to about 10 to 15 scenarios. Um, and they have about four hours to do that, enter it into their system. And then they come back to the website. Next slide. And they're able to download scenario orders that go with those patient cases. Next slide. And this is what um, those scenarios look like. And they're also given a worksheet to keep track of when they enter those orders, what kind of information do they get back from the EHR. All sorts of uh, options, as you can see here. Next slide. Um, and they have two hours to accomplish that. Next slide. And then they're asked to go back to the website and for each of those orders enter in very specific information from their worksheet. So they may track a lot of things on the worksheet that happened when they entered those orders. But here they're asked for only very specific questions about those orders. Next slide. And uh, they enter that back into the website. Next slide. Um, and then they get feedback on how they did in the test based on categories of evaluation of the test. One of them, the categories, is therapeutic duplication, which is how well does the system pick up an order for codeine and Tylenol number three. Single and cumulative dose limits, can the system pick up a tenfold excess dose of methotrexate. Allergies and cross allergies, wrong route of administration, drug-drug interactions, and we only focus on the significant ones. Next slide. And dose limits based on a patient's diagnosis. So are uh, we uh, reminding a doctor not to order, uh, for instance, a beta blocker in a patient with asthma? Uh, or are we reminding a, um, a physician not to order um, a uh, drug that might be toxic to a fetus and a woman is pregnant? Another category is uh, dose adjustments based on a patient's age and weight. Another category might be dosages based on a, a laboratory studies such as renal function. And then uh, two other categories, cost of care, repeating the same test order in a short time frame, or even corollary orders. If we order a land, did we order a level? Next slide, please. And here are the results they get uh, sent back to them, all those categories and how the hospital performed in it. They get a score in every category, and then they get an overall score. So that's essentially how the test works. Next slide, please. And so when the test first came out in 2008, um, we were able to uh, study the results of use in, the, in um, about uh, uh, a group of hospitals who initially took it. And what we found is enormous variation in how 62 hospitals scored on this test when it first came out. And we found that uh, the hospitals only picked up, on average, about 53% of medication orders within the test that actually would cause a fatality. So a small number of the test orders will actually reliably represent scenarios that would kill a patient, and only 53% of those were detected. The overall performance on the test varied from 10 to 82 percent of the uh, problematic cases being detected by the operational EHR system. So both an enormous amount of variability and a high degree of vulnerability in operational EHR systems to picking up what most people would say are sort of clear-cut safety problems, some of which can be highly fatal. Next slide. And if you look at this data broken out by the vendors uh, represented in the test, so this is all the hospitals, those 62 hospitals, broken out by their individual EMR vendors. So each vertical group of boxes is a separate EHR vendor. What you see first is the vendor number one on the left, the homegrown system in Boston, did the best. 
but what you also see is there's enormous variability among the vendors outlined on this list. There's more actually variation within a vendor group than between vendor groups, which strongly suggested to us that uh, performance of these systems in terms of safety has more to do with local implementation than it does the vendor itself. And this has been borne out by other work that has occurred. Next slide. And if you look at how hospitals have performed on this test from 2009 to 2013, uh, and this is as yet unpublished work, what you see is that hospitals have clearly gotten better on this test over time. So they have learned, which was one of uh, the key things we were hoping, is hospitals would use this test and they can use it twice a year to actually learn and improve, and they have. Um, next slide, please. And they've done well in areas of great emphasis. So they've done very well in picking up allergies and cross allergies uh, and preventing those problems, and very well in dealing with drug-drug interactions. But certain categories they've never really improved on, such as drug diagnosis. Let's make sure we don't order a fetal fatal drug in a pregnant woman, um, and in uh, dosage adjustment for renal function, or in corollary ordering um, uh, tests. Uh, uh, for a monitoring of very toxic drugs. So those areas haven't changed as much. So although there's been improvement in some categories, there's been no change in virtually others, which is very interesting giving all the focus on meaningful use, but may also explain um, why we've been unable to make major improvements in safety now that we've installed all these systems, because operationally the things that have the greatest impact may not be performing as we would expect or hope they would. Next slide. And I think this goes back to uh, several IOM reports that said that to ultimately uh, get the impact from health IT, we need to understand that health IT is just one circle and many other circles here. It's part of a larger socio-technical environment. And to be successful, we not only have to have the best technology, but we also have to have the best socio-technical approach. And I think that's certainly been a very key observation as we move forward, uh, that just hoping the technology alone was going to improve safety is probably not going to come to pass. There are many other factors. Next slide. And this was an article we wrote on what it might look like to create a socio-technical model for medication safety. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, but I think in conclusion, what this test is recognizing and, and, and documenting is that uh, we need to continually monitor and improve these systems for their safety performance, that uh, that monitoring must go on in operational systems that can't go on just in vendor software on the shelf. We need both, much like aviation uh, evaluates the uh, Boeing airplane. They also evaluate how it's operated by United. I think that is consistent with the socio-technical approach. And uh, we're really fortunate, David and I, to have gotten funding from ARC to expand, update, and broaden this test to many other categories, including usability and uh, ability to pick up errors and a variety of other things. So uh, um, I, I think now I can take some questions, and then David will pick it up from here. Well, thank you, David. And uh, this is Barry back on. And you do have a few questions here, so uh, let's, uh, let's get to them. Um, one of the listeners asked, ONC, IOM, um, ARC, and LeapFrog were mentioned, but ISO was not. Is there any relationship or connection between EHR safety recommend recommendations described and ISO standards for software development? Yeah, well, that I can't answer that question. Maybe others can, but this is clearly what I described as not related to ISO standards. Um, now, it may be in the future, but it is not now. Okay. David Bates, we, we've had some presentations in the, in the implementation usability and safety uh, subgroup that do relate to ISO standards, and I think that they, they probably will play a role uh, in the future. Thank you, David. Um, Great. Okay, lots of questions here, so let's just keep going. Um, uh, one of the questions was, would you be able to comment on one, when the ambulatory simulation will be released? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, we need to update that, and that's funding dependent, so that will probably be something that comes out of discussions with the funders in this area. David Bates, any thoughts there? No, I agree. Okay. okay. Um, 
On slide 49, general diagnosis is not required for medication order entry. Um, excuse me, <laughs> just scrolled up on me. Medication order entry, prescription orders, so it's harder to edit for that. Would love any support to require diagnosis associated to the medication being entered before the order can be completed and filled. Um, was, was that understandable, or do you want me to rephrase it? No, I think it's a good point. I think David may talk about it in his section. So, David, I don't know if you have any comments about it now. Sure. Uh, well, Gordy Schiff at our institution just got funded, actually, to do a study to look at, at how to practically uh, do that. Providers have resisted uh, uh, giving, the, giving the diagnosis, and it would have clear benefits for safety, but it, it does take extra time. It's an added element. If we did that for every prescription, could be burdensome, so so I think we need to work out the logistics of it. All right. Well, gentlemen, here's a somewhat loaded question for you, but you mentioned the way Boeing equipment and airlines are regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. Do you see the need for a similar agency in healthcare? Yeah, uh, 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 there's lots of discussion about that, and there are current active efforts to uh, try to find a way to provide oversight for that, uh, but I don't see a new agency in the cards. David, what do you think? No, I agree. I, I think that the, the, the center that Jonathan alluded to uh, you know, w will be very helpful, and, and one question would be uh, how broad should the purview of that uh, center be? Um, we, we do have uh, large numbers of patients who are injured annually as a result of uh, health care that, that we deliver. Um, uh, health IT is a small uh, fraction uh, of that. Um, and and uh, th there are strong arguments in, fa in favor of setting up a, uh, a new agency uh, like that, but there has not been much appetite for that uh, on, the, on the part of Congress. I would agree. Cool. Okay. Uh, the performance of hospitals in the leapfrog testing was stratified by vendor. Was that the EHR vendor or the rules database third party? It was. Vendor? It was the EHR vendor. But that, interesting. Yeah, that that question. I mean, what's really relevant here is is who you're using for your under, under underlying uh, uh, rules database, and so so that's another layer around this. Agreed. Yeah, and but that slide was the HR vendor. Interesting. Um, question: uh, Were you able to correlate test scores in actual hospital performance? Well, I think that's what David did in his study. So I'll let him comment. Yeah, you know that that's accurate. The study that we did showed that performing better was associated with with uh, with um, better medication safety. David, you're not going to have anything left to talk about when we get to your presentation. No, I, uh, there, there are a few more things I, I have to say. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, keeping with the questions here, how do you balance the urgency of hitting dates and safety? Uh, I'm going to try to stand the question. Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, meant uh, how do you balance the urgency of hitting dates for implementation uh, versus the uh, need for safety? Yeah, I, I think David's going to talk about that in his talk. Well, that yeah. So I, I think that's a, an interesting question. Um, th there are we're in the midst of a very large implementation right now, and there would be huge cost to us if we did not uh, hit the implementation dates. Um, you don't have to have everything ready on day one. There's some things that are more important than others. Um, I, I think it's very important to hit your implementation dates, and if you don't do that, then then there are all sorts of uh, sorts of downsides. Um, it is possible to, to add things over time, and I, I think that's probably the the most practical approach. You you want to you want to go live. You need to make sure that you have um, a, a reasonable amount in place, uh, but you don't have to have everything in place. And you'll be making iterative changes to the system really for for uh, forever. But but certainly o over the first uh, several years after an implementation. Well, here's an interesting question. If human error is the problem variable in both EHR and paper charts, why is it worse in the EHR? I don't know that to be the case. Um, so, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it is worse. We, we have a, we have a very interesting, I think, paper coming out in in BMJ Quality and Safety that that talks about this, and and uh, Vimla Patel was the lead author on on one part of this, which which talked about human cognition, and and error, and uh, and actually the things that that um, decision support is good at are, are really fairly different than the things that that um, that humans are good at, at thinking about. And if designers really factor that in uh, together, I, I think it'll be possible to to make systems much safer than they are uh, today. That certainly happened in other industries like nuclear power and aviation. Yep. Um, this one isn't a question, actually. It's a comment, and I think it uh, it supports something you said earlier, David Bates. Um, but it's a comment. NCPDP standard uh, has this availability of they're referring to the ability to connect uh, the diagnosis to the uh, order. We had pushback from our providers on uh, on HIPAA um, privacy about sending the diagnosis on the prescription. Um. You know, I, 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 uh, I don't, I, I, I don't know the, the legal details about this, but I, I, I really think any place that you're sending a prescription is likely to be a business associate. So I don't see why it should be a HIPAA, HIPAA issue. Maybe there's more to it than I'm seeing. Um, question: What about ECRI PSO? How do their insights feed into your work? So far, they don't. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I I'm a, a fan of the of the ECRI PSO, and we're we're part of it. And I do think that that uh, um, efforts like that will be useful in identifying the the safety issues that that are present. Uh, you know, really across a broad range of institutions and vendors, it's been hard to share safety issues. And uh, and that's what this uh, PSO is is uh, is focused on. So that that's one effort to do that. Uh, another effort is exploring ways that we might jointly publish with ECRI on uh, hospitals who've taken the test and reported safety problems. So that's another area that we've explored, which might be a promising one. Okay, we have a question. We have providers who ignore the alerts. How do you balance giving information and the pro uh, the provider paying attention? Yeah, I think David's going to talk about that. I, I will. Uh, that's that's a great question. It's one of the fundamental questions today in informatics and around clinical decision support. I think it's incumbent on institutions to try and do a good job of reducing the number of of uh, of uh, not of unuse, unhelpful or unuseful alerts, and if you do that, um, uh, you can then ask providers to pay attention to the really important ones. We also need to do some things like make the important, the, the truly important ones look different to providers than the unimportant ones. Um, so, so that's actually a lot of the work of the next uh, five years or so. And I'll, sh I'll show you some data that suggests that it's possible to, to do uh, pretty well with that, much better than most organizations are doing today. So, so maybe we should move on to David's talk since we're getting into it with all the questions. Yeah, we are. And um, I think I'm going to uh, cut off the questions here. I do have just one other comment that I'd like to read from uh, one of the presenters. Um, this states, uh, just an FYI for the presenters, AMA has a policy against including diagnosis on a prescription. It stems from 1993 and likely was born out of privacy concerns, administrative burden on the doctor, in my, and in my opinion, concerns about off-label use. I am active in NCPDP, and Gordy has been part of our discussions. Happy to help in any way I can. Uh, this comes from one of the listeners. Uh, I'll, I'll give her name in this case, Laura Toper. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, yep. All right. I'm I'm still waiting for my com computer to wake up here. We went to sleep while we were uh, talking, so, uh, so maybe we could take one more question. Okay. Well, I have a, a question actually, so I'm going to slip mine in. Um, David, in all of the work that you've done, have 
has there been any indication, I know you showed different vendors, we, we had the question about which underlying database they use, which uh, might influence things. The other thing uh, that I was wondering about was whether there's any indication of the degree to which user interface um, affects things from a peer usability standpoint, because uh, their interfaces can be quite different, and one might imagine that uh, the way things are arranged on screen or the colors chosen or any number of things uh, might have an impact on these types of errors. Uh, we don't you track that. Any evidence of that? We don't, we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't track that. It's a great question. We just don't track it currently. Yeah, I'm actually going to show you some empiric evidence about that, there, there, around which there's not very much, but all, we've done several studies. And not surprisingly, uh, as you'll see, if you, if you have um, um, alerts and, and suggestions that have better usability characteristics, pe people respond to them much better. Hmm. Okay, how are you doing with your computer there, David? I, I'm, I'm all set. Okay, uh, well then let me introduce you and thank you very much, uh, David Klassen, for a great presentation. Um, uh, David, by the way, for the listeners, uh, will have to be leaving a little bit early, so he probably won't be uh, available uh, for the questions after uh, David Bates's uh, uh, presentation. But again, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Bates. Dr. Bates is an expert in patient safety using information technology to improve care, quality of care, cost effectiveness, and outcomes assessment in medical practice. He is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a professor of health policy and management at the Harvard School of Public Health, where he co-directs the program in clinical effectiveness. He directs the Center for Patient Safety Research and Practice at Brigham and Women's Hospital and serves as an external program lead for research in the World Health Organization's Global Alliance for Patient Safety. He is president of the International Society for Quality in Healthcare and the editor of the Journal of Patient Safety. He serves as the principal investigator of the Health Information Technology Center for Education and Research on Therapeutics. He has been elected to the Institute of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, and the American College of Medical Informatics, and was chairman of the board of the AMA, excuse me, of AMIA. He has had over 600 peer-reviewed publications. David Bates, it sounds like you're a very busy guy. His uh, presentation... Thanks, thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we've already changed slides. The presentation is CPOE and CDS lessons from research and implementation. Thanks, Barry. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, David Klassen has has uh, given you a lot of uh, big picture stuff, and uh, I'm going to go through um, some some more granular details about how to how to actually do this well. I'll. Uh, briefly go through some evidence that computer order entry and, and clinical decision support uh, work, and I'll uh, provide some specifics. Um, and then I'll talk about implementation. I'll give you a, a couple of case examples, talk about some of the common pitfalls in implementation, how you can overcome them, and then uh, what, what you can do to get value, and then I will wrap up. Next slide. Um, th these are some data from a study that we did relatively recently at six uh, uh, community hospitals in Massachusetts, and we uh, went in and using a modified version of the uh, trigger tool uh, focused on adverse drug events, looked to see how many adverse drug events uh, these institutions had. And the key findings were that every single hospital, even though these were really good hospitals, had a pretty substantial adverse drug event rate, 11 to 19 and a half uh, adverse drug events per 100 admissions. Uh, but notably, 68 to 85 percent of them were, were uh, preventable. And when we did this before, the rates were around 7 percent. This was in academic hospitals. Only about a third were preventable. So uh, the, the biggest thing was that, that an even higher percentage of the adverse drug events were preventable, and every single hospital had a substantial adverse drug event rate. Next slide. So a computer order entry as, as part of the EHR is, is really centrally important because most of the things that happen in a hospital occur as the result of a doctor's order. 
And therefore, you really need to get the physician or other ordering provider to use the computer. This is a key opportunity to ch change behavior. And we, it gives us lots of opportunities to improve uh, performance. And, and uh, thus, CDS is, a, is, is a, a very key mechanism which can be used to get providers to change what they do. Next slide. Um, CDSSs have a number of uh, functions. These are some, some uh, this is one framework from, from uh, uh, Randolph et al. from, from JAMA in 1999, and it was based on some earlier work by, by Pryor. And uh, uh, they suggested that there were uh, uh, th this set of, of key functions of decisioning, decision support systems. Alerting is around things like a high lab value. A reminding is for a mammogram. Critiquing would be for rejecting an order. Uh, interpreting would be for interpreting an ECG. Uh, predicting, uh, we're getting higher level here, would, for example, give you a risk of mortality using a severity score. Assisting might help you with picking the right antibiotic. Uh, diagnosing would be uh, coming up with a diagnosis, for example, with a, a patient with chest pain. And then finally, the highest level is suggesting, for example, for adjusting a me mechanical uh, ventilator in a patient with ARDS. Next slide. Um, these things have a variety of underpinnings. So uh, uh, alerts and reminders and critiques are typically simple if-then rules. Uh, sometimes there are other Boolean operators. Um, and alerts typically use event monitors, which are programs that, that can go through uh, databases and evaluate streams of data. Uh, I'll note that finding the right person is hard, and that's something that most institutions struggle with a bit. Um, reminder, reminders notify providers or patients of tasks to be done. Uh, critiques uh, offer alternative suggestions and so on. And interpreting, predicting, diagnosing, assisting, and suggesting are higher order. They're higher to program. They require more data. And most institutions probably are not doing very much of that yet. Next slide. Um, we went through our experiences with, uh, with decision support. Uh, we implemented a lot of decision support over the years and, and really learned a lot through the school of hard knocks. And, uh, and here are 10 uh, uh, key lessons that we learned. The first is that s speed is really critically important. If you can't do things rapidly, uh, providers will, will lose interest. And your goal should really be less than sub-second screen uh, flips. Uh, you want to anticipate users' needs and try and deliver in real time. It's essential to try and fit into the user's workflow. Uh, little things, like where you'd set the default, uh, can make a big difference. It can make the difference between having a big impact and not having a big impact. Uh, physicians resist stopping when you make suggestions, but they're much more willing to change uh, direction. Uh, simple interventions typically work best. Uh, a, a rule around uh, giving a patient uh, an aspirin if they've had a, a myocardial infarction is pretty likely to work. If you try to set up a, a set of rules around patients with congestive heart failure, that's a much taller order. Uh, you can ask people for information, but you should do that very, very selectively, and you want to make sure you really need it and don't have it someplace else. There's nothing that makes providers matter than to having to enter something that, that they know has already been entered someplace else. It's really important to monitor how you're doing, uh, get feedback, and then respond to it. And if you look at many of the institutions that have not done so well with this, it's because they have not had good approaches for monitoring uh, what their decision support is doing. And then finally, knowledge-based systems have to be managed and maintained. So you need to know what rules you have in place, when they were implemented, when they were last reviewed. And you need to uh, make sure that you keep up with the latest evidence, because things are always changing. Next slide. Um, here are some examples of, uh, of st studies that we did that, that showed improvement. One was the NEPHRO study, which looked at the effect of delivering real-time decision support for patients with renal insufficiency. And uh, the way that we did this was uh, notable. Um, the patient knows the patient's, the, sorry, the, the computer knows the patient's age, their gender, their, their uh, race, and uh, um, it can then uh, do a calculation of uh, what their glomerular filtration rate is. And uh, um, at baseline, 42% uh, of our patients had some degree of renal insufficiency, which is much higher than we'd expected going in. 
Uh, we found that uh, in, in the base case, people you only pick the right dose and frequency 54 and 35 percent of the time. Uh, after providing suggestions, that went up to 67 and 59 percent, and patients stayed in the hospital uh, half a day less after doing that. Now, uh, David showed you some data suggesting that hospitals haven't done very well in this area. I would submit that this is probably the, the single area for of clinical decision support that delivers the greatest benefit inside the hospital. So it's one that everybody should have on their to-do list if they're not doing something with it already. Next slide. Um, I, we, this came up as a, as a question. Um, um, you know, how, how, can you, how can you refine your rules? And in most systems, most alerts get overridden. The, the industry standard, you know, based, on, uh, based mostly on the published data, is that about 90% of alerts get overridden. I think that is, in a system like that, you're delivering far too many alerts. And what you need to do is go through and, and turn off uh, many of your alerts, or at least make them uh, non-interruptive. And uh, we uh, identified a highly selected set of drug alerts in the outpatient setting, um, looked over a six-month period. 71% of the alerts were non-interruptive. Only 29% were interruptive. Uh, when something's interruptive, we, we suggest that you either shouldn't do it or you need to do some other testing related to it. And of the interruptive alerts, 67% were accepted, suggesting that it is feasible to get to a level like this. Next slide. Um, one, another best practice in delivering your alerts is, uh, is tiering. And we were, did a study that basically let us uh, uh, do a natural experiment around this. We studied two academic medical centers. They were using the same knowledge base. Uh, site A used three tiers, and Site B had all the alerts as uh, interrupted. And the three tiers were, one, you, you, you can't pass. It was a hard stop. Uh, tier two was, um, you, you needed to, uh, to, you should either consider doing, do, doing something different or you should, uh, for example, order some monitoring. And the third tier was information only. Site B had all the alerts set as interruptive and uh, we used exactly the same knowledge base in the two uh, centers. And what we found was interesting, um, at, the, uh, at the tiered site, 100% of the time, uh, providers paid attention to the warnings, but they only paid attention 34% of the time at the non-tiered site. So that means that 66% of the time they were running the stop signs. And notably, the overall alert acceptance was much higher at the tiered site at 29% versus 10%. I would argue you, could, you should still be doing better than, uh, than 29%, but that's higher than, than most organizations are, do, are, 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 are able to achieve today. Next slide. Uh, another issue is which, which alerts to display. Um, uh, and I, I would suggest you should be interrupting with only the most important uh, warnings, and you should tier. Uh, the jury's still out regarding whether it's even useful to display non-interruptive warnings. Uh, you should have regular review of the alerts. You should track how pr providers are responding to them as practices change. And, uh, and we argued in a paper in Health Affairs in 2011 that sharing around this would help. This would be a common good. Uh, it really d doesn't differ very much from institution to institution. The sharing could even be in international because uh, for many of these things, really, uh, things are, are pretty similar across the international boundaries. Next slide. Uh, now we're, we're getting into the, uh, the uh, Barry's question, which is the human factors issue. Um, we uh, uh, published some work around this. It was led by Shoba Van Salker. And uh, um, in, in this paper, we made some recommendations about how you should, uh, how you should uh, uh, alarm based on human factors principles. Um, the things that we suggested were that you need uniform alerting mechanisms and standardized alarm responses. Uh, alarm philosophies should minimize false alerts, as that was suggested by another question. Uh, placement of the alerts does impact the likelihood that users will see the alert. So if visibility is critical, the font size has to be large enough to be readily, readily legible, and all the visual alerts should be prioritized. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, in addition, color should be used to help cue the user about the level of a specific alert, and the numbers of colors that are used should be minimized. If you use too many colors, people won't be able to follow what they mean. Uh, to make the visual alerts more distinct, it's important to minimize the number of visual features that are shared between alerts. And the text-based information should be succinct. You can have a link out to more detailed information. Providers really like that and find it useful. But uh, the, what you show on the initial screen should really be brief. Next slide. Uh, we then looked uh, empirically to see uh, how does use of some of these human factors principles affect alert acceptance. And this is the, the data that I mentioned about various uh, questions. Uh, we looked at 51,000 drug-drug interaction alerts, both inpatient and outpatient. Providers paid very little attention to the non-interruptive alerts. They accepted only 1.4% of those. For the interruptive alerts, user acceptance was positively correlated with how often the alerts were displayed. The quality of the display very strongly associated with the quality of display uh, with the alert level, which you would hope they would be. Next slide. Uh, alert acceptance was also higher for inpatients, who probably tend to be a little sicker, and for drugs with dose-dependent toxicity. Furthermore, the textual information did influence the reaction, and providers were more likely to modify the prescription if the message contained detailed advice on how to manage the drug-drug interaction. So people are looking for, for very specifically, what should I do? Should I, uh, you know, decrease the frequency of the cumin dosage? When should I check the INR again? That kind of thing. Next slide. Um, you know, an interesting philosophical question is which is more important, uh, contact, content, or, uh, or, or management of the way that you deliver the alerts. So content really relates to what is the underlying uh, knowledge base that you're using, and content is certainly more generalizable. But management probably has an even bigger impact on, in terms of how much people pay attention to the, your, your suggestions. And it can have... Uh, you can have great contact and no impact. Uh, management has at least two dimensions. One is uh, attention to human factors issues and uh, delivery and display, but a second is implementation and doing that well. And the SAFER guidelines, which David uh, Klassen referred to, uh, really uh, gets into how you uh, implement well. And you have to get a good score on all of these uh, to, get to, to, to really uh, uh, get benefit. Another issue is you want to avoid uh, displaying things as alerts uh, when you possibly can. If you can use things like order sentences or other types of decision support to steer people to doing the right thing, that tends to be much more effective than interrupting them later in the process. Next slide. Um, another piece of work that we did that was led, again, by Shoba Fensalker, uh, looked at, at uh, what high-priority drug-drug interactions are. One question that comes up sometimes is, should we have any hard stops? And I think there should be some. Uh, these are 15 drug class pairs that were highly uh, clinically significant. They should essentially never be co-prescribed. Co um, we're not sure that this is a complete list of these, but we think it's a, a very good list. There, there are things that don't come up uh, very often. Um, so, you know, and this list is published, it should be in everybody's, th th these alerts should be in everyone's uh, uh, system. Now, I, I do want to note that less significant DDIs are, are still significant, they're much more prevalent, they probably cause actually much more harm than these 15, which don't come up that often. But they tend to depend on patient characteristics, drug dosages and timing, uh, concomitant, concomitant conditions like hypokalemia and so on. And uh, at the end of the day, if we're going to improve the sensitivity and specificity of drug-drug interaction warnings, we need more investment in evidence review and generation and, and better methods to make drug-drug uh, alerts conditional on, uh, on other patient data. Uh, work that's been led by Dan Malone out of the University of Arizona has, has advanced this uh, ball too, and there are a number of uh, publications coming out from that group. That's work that's been supported by ARC. Next slide. In addition to the high-priority drug-drug interactions, uh, there are a number of low-priority drug-drug interactions. And, and uh, again, in work that was led by Shoba, we went through and, and identified uh, a list of drug-drug interactions that are often shown, uh, but that do not warrant interruptive status. And this is, again, a, a published list. Uh, you can look these up, and you, sh you should not have uh, any of these DDIs being displayed in your system. When we looked 
that what was being displayed in a number of, of systems, uh, many of these drug-drug interactions did show up still. Next slide. Um, decision support can also help with uh, improving the use of your uh, problem list. This is work that's been led by uh, Adam Wright, and here we looked at, at uh, 18 diagnoses that are some of the most important ones in terms of, uh, of uh, delivering decision support and, and used uh, other cues that were in the record like use of a medication or, uh, or uh, um, uh, submission of a, of a visit diagnosis and then developed rules for the presence of a, of a problem that was not on the problem list, which often has implications for, for medication safety. Um, after we uh, put in place suggestions to providers to add these problems to the problem list, you can see that the, the proportion of the, the likelihood that these important problems would get added was much higher in the intervention than in the control group. Next slide. Um, this slide it just basically shows some data from uh, Randy, Randy Siebel from the New England Journal, which looks at uh, differences in achievement of composite standards for diabetes care and outcomes and practices with electronic health records and those with paper records. And basically, the, the key finding was that, that, uh, that practices that were using electronic records did do better. Next slide. Uh, there are new technologies which I think uh, can be helpful in, in terms of, uh, in particular, uh, detecting a deterioration. And these are some data. Uh, uh, this, this is a, a, a set of tools that have been developed by a company called EarlySense. They built a device that sits between the mattress and the bed so it doesn't touch the patient. It monitors the patient's uh, pulse, their respiratory rate, and uh, whether or not they're moving. If the patient's uh, pulse or respiratory rate goes above a certain threshold, the nurse who's carrying a smartphone gets a message on their, their phone. Uh, the message here says that there's a high heart rate. It was a, bit, uh, a pulse of 136. And the, the, the notion is that the, the nurse then can go take a look at that patient and intervene. Next slide. And uh, we, we studied this at, uh, at a hospital in uh, California, these uh, results come from the, from the American Journal of Medicine and, and basically found that the length of stay uh, fell in the intervention group, uh, uh, in the intervention unit in the pre-post uh, comparison by, by uh, around 9%. And the LOS in the ICU for patients who are coming from med-surge med fell 45%. Uh, in addition, the likelihood of having a code blue event was uh, was substantially lower, 86% uh, lower. Next slide. Um, computer order entry can also have uh, substantial uh, financial benefits to an institution. This is a work that was led by Renu Kaushal. was published in JAMIA in 2006. We uh, estimated what, what we had saved at the Brigham uh, as a result of computer order entry, and we estimated we'd save $28.5 million over 10 years. The net operating savings were $9.5 million. Um, more important than what the total savings were, which, you know, which could change with how big you are, are, are uh, where the savings came from. And I thought this was interesting. The, the biggest uh, place where, where we got benefit was through renal dosing. Uh, the second leading area of savings was nursing time utilization, followed by a specific drug guidance and then uh, adverse drug event prevention. Next slide. So um, uh, now I'm going to go into what can go wrong if you, uh, w when, when you are uh, implementing. And this is some work that was led by Ross Capel, uh, published in JAMA. He evaluated a commercial computer order entry application at the University of Pennsylvania and asked their users about their impressions with the system. Found many situations in which what they referred to as a leading computer order entry system facilitated medication error risk. Uh, it often took many screens to do things. Uh, providers noted that the views that they needed were uh, not, not available. Um, I apologize, my computer is just uh, turned off again. It will, it will wake up here, but it may take a minute or so. Okay. 
and others, including Joan Ash, have also uh, reported uh, on this. Uh, next slide. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, David, we can hear you. Okay, good. Could I have the next slide? So, uh, you know, I have had some, some concerns about the Capel study. They, they didn't actually count errors or adverse events. And, uh, and they said that other studies focused only on the advantages of, of those systems, which is not uh, strictly accurate. The computer order entry application that they studied was an old one, but this paper was really um, a landmark paper. It stimulated a great deal of val valuable debate, identified a couple of key points in my mind. One is that you have to change systems after you implement. And uh, what they found was that the, the system that they uh, evaluated was implemented and then not too much was changed. And the other point is that software alone is, uh, is insufficient. Next slide. Um, a more concerning study is a study that was published by Han et al. in pediatrics in 2005. And they studied children who were being transported in for special care. What they found was that the mortality rate in those children uh, went up by a factor of three after introduction of a commercial computer order entry application. Now, this study design was before after, and there were a number of other changes that were made at the same time that computer order entry was implemented. And for reasons that are not clear, they didn't report the overall mortality rate. They just reported the mortality rate for those transported in for special care. Next slide. Uh, so uh, it's very instructive to go through and see what was done when they actually implemented. First, that computer order entry was introduced very rapidly over a six-day period. Next, after implementation, order entry wasn't allowed until the patient had actually entered the hospital and had been logged into the system. In addition, uh, after computer order entry implementation, all the drugs, including vasoactive agents, were moved to the central pharmacy. And the pharmacy wasn't allowed to process medication orders until after they were activated. Furthermore, and this may, not, may or may not seem like a big deal to you, but many order sets were not available initially. And it turns out that it's much uh, quicker to write an, uh, a, set of order, a group of orders using an order set than it is to write them. Uh, 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 when you're using an order set and writing electronically, you can do things uh, very quickly. If you have to write orders one at a time, it really slows you down. And the net result here was substantial delays in care delivery. These were children who were mostly coming in either in a helicopter or in an ambulance, and they needed care uh, very rapidly. Next slide. So at the end of the day, this study, I think, was weak methodologically, but this increase in the mortality rate was very large. It was of obvious concern. And I think uh, introducing these delays in this group probably did cause these, this, this increase. The organization broke a number of the rules for implementation, and it's essential for other organizations to handle the socio-technical aspects better. Next slide. Um, so how, how, how can you get into trouble around this? Well, you know, I'm here I'm talking about implementing a computer order entry, but this, this in particular, but this holds for many other uh, types of IT implementations. One is to not recognize how big a change this truly is. It's expensive. It's a big, huge process change. You, uh, you also can get in trouble if you don't sufficiently engage both your administrative and your clinical leadership. You have to have both those groups uh, on your side. It's also uh, easy not to get do necessary preparation with the key stakeholders. Sometimes it takes as much as two years to have all the key groups meet and, and, and agree on some, some of the key uh, uh, parameters, for example, around how you're going to manage things around your lab process or your blood banking uh, process. Next slide. Um, could I have the next slide? Uh, another way to get in trouble is to go too fast early on. So if you either turn on the whole hospital at once or turn on too much decision support at once, that can cause uh, problems. Another uh, issue is trying to fix previously existing uh, policy problems at the time that you implement. It's easy to, uh, to, to get stuck. Um, 
a number of institutions have gotten in trouble by turning on too much decision support early on. It's much better to phase it in. Uh, the, the computer entry issues at, at Cedar sinai got a lot of press, and one of the things that really drove the providers there crazy was that they decided that they were going to turn on all their drug-drug interactions at the beginning, and, uh, and they uh, uh, were not going to back off from that, and the providers uh, really revolted. Next slide. Uh, after implementation, there, there are a number of issues uh, uh, that you can get into, too. Uh, one is a failure to provide users an easy mechanism for reporting ongoing problems. They have to feel like they can do that and that, that you're paying attention to them. Uh, another issue is failure to make sufficient changes to your application. Um, a further issue is, uh, and this seems to me to occur in every institution that I go to, is failure to devote sufficient resources to making changes to the application. If you don't do that, you won't get value. When we, when we did this, we got into this trap and ended up with a, a list of 300 things that we knew were all good things to do, and we just did not have the people to, uh, to uh, actually implement them. And then finally, uh, it's essential to have sufficient support for the underlying system. You, for example, have to keep your network up to speed. You have to have enough terminals. We got into issues with both those things that were uh, really amongst the lowest points of my experiences in informatics. At one point, we uh, did not keep our network up, up to speed and had issues where we just, where basically the whole system slowed down so that it was taking 30 minutes for a screen flip. And uh, I mean, that, that, was, that was really awful. At another point, um, we added the di our dietitians to the system, and they just began using all the terminals uh, at such a level that our, our doctors couldn't find a terminal to, uh, to use. Uh, so, so things like that are, are really important as well. Next slide. The path to success, uh, much of it is the inverse of the common pitfalls, but not all. Anybody will have issues that the leadership needs to deal with. Uh, we've had a couple instances in which a very high-level clinical leader uh, uh, basically revolted and, and had to be uh, taken to task. Um, you do need to keep in mind that it will be worth it down the road. You have to pay attention to detail, de details to get value. It doesn't just come with a successful implementation. And uh, this sort of thing is much bigger than you you anything that you, if you haven't done it before, it's any bigger than anything you've previously tried on the IT front. Next slide. The critical success factors in implementation, um, here we, we you know, derive these from uh, talking to a large number of institutions from around the country were uh, long, strong leadership and long-term commitment, uh, creating a culture of innovation, having really strong uh, project management, having a close attention to clinical processes, so really going through and understanding those, and then finally having a focus on, on quality. Next slide. Uh, during implementation, you need strong teams at the point of care. You need somebody on site for the first two weeks of implementation, 24-7. Really good help desk uh, support afterwards. You need to respond and how well they're doing in terms of actually dealing with frontline issues. Uh, you also need to track uh, feedback. And it's best to deliver personal follow-up about the changes you've made. Um, uh, other organizations basically made uh, needed uh, needed changes to fit clinical issues. Uh, um, some groups turn out to need special attention, and uh, this tends to be worse in the most highly stressed groups. We had one uh, service in which the average census for one of the residents was 70 patients, and that individual just needed some help to be able to get through the day. Uh, you would argue that you could argue that perhaps nobody should be covering for 70 patients but uh, you may uncover things like that as you, as you do this. Next slide. Um, uh, around leadership, th this again comes from a, a, a large survey of, of, uh, of organizations around the country that we talked to. I'll give you a few quotes. Solving the technological issues gets you 25% there. You need leadership to provide the vision to take you the rest of the way. Uh, another quote was, commitment of the key leadership is as important as the quality of the technology. Another was, if leadership isn't clear in its conviction, clear in its communication, and clear in its steadfastness, then I think your chances of success start to drop rapidly. 
And then finally, when there was an issue, the CIO and the CMO sat down and addressed it quickly. Next slide. Another quote which I especially like is when there were bumps and bruises along the way, which there always are, and some people questioned whether they should be doing this, they'd get a friendly call from the CEO saying, this is the direction we're going in and everyone's going to march in this direction. Next slide. Um, in terms of physician barriers, so, uh, one quote was, the interesting thing is once we get physicians beyond the initial perception that computer entry is time consuming, they can't think of going back. Another said, anticipate the needs of the physicians, have IS people uh, make rounds with the physicians. Often the IS group is just too divorced from the frontline providers. Another said, find a successful site and have them sell it. Another said, uh, we kept redoing the system for five years after it came up. And, uh, and then finally, our CEO said this was going to be a clinician-driven process from the beginning. Next slide. Um, in terms of project management, uh, the, uh, someone said, we would go out and hover in the areas. We made rounds frequently. Oftentimes, we would be there just before the physician, just as they were getting ready to call. We would say, here we are. That, that's, that's the kind of thing to aspire to. Next slide. Another individual said about clinical processes, what screws you up is realities that need differences. It's a chaotic system. Differences that you would not imagine would matter do when you analyze it to the level of the unique workflows. Next slide. In terms of standards, infrastructure, and knowledge base, uh, one said you can't just buy anything that works out of the box from the vendors. Smaller hospitals will not be able to afford to customize the products that suit their needs. Another said if there's a realistic non-vendor-based assessment of the CPOE technology and where it will be in two to three years, then I as a leader could leverage my political capital with some reassurance that there's going to be some flesh on the bones. And a third said it will be helpful if hospitals interested in CPOE can share the contract or RFP so that nobody has to reinvent the wheel when they deal with the vendors. Next slide. Uh, critical success factors, one said, I'm not sure any of us know exactly how we've succeeded. A lot of it has been so evolutionary and we've been at it year after year. Next slide. And in terms of rem remaining barriers, uh, staff, money, money, staff, I don't think it's physician acceptance, which it used to be. I think that something terrible has happened. Uh, we've been successful. I think that physicians can just take more of this than we ever have the capability of delivering. Next slide. So what does it take to get uh, benefits? Well, you have to have a successful implementation. You have to decide on a core of decision support, and that implies having good organizational structures that enable groups to reach consensus. Uh, we use a great deal of, uh, of virtual uh, 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 support around this and use eRoom, for example, quite a bit. Um, you will have to make many changes. You need an architecture that enables you to be agile. You need sufficient resources to keep up. Uh, the rule is to have a long queue of things. Uh, and you want to start low and go slow, like with exercise, but you need to end up with enough. Next slide. So uh, to, to wrap up, uh, leadership is key in, I, in all change. Uh, I would say it's probably even more true in this area than, uh, than in many others. Uh, the socio-technical is that some of those quotes suggested is harder than the technical. Uh, you have lots of decisions when implementing decision support. Uh, the de degree of benefit is directly proportional to how much decision support you include, but you really don't want to overdo it at the beginning. As David underscored, you, it's really important to test post-implementation. Um, I think we'll want to make many decisions in the future. Uh, we'll need to make many decisions in the future about uh, autonomy, uh, provider autonomy, that, and, and how much to give them, and that, that will relate to how much improvement we get with respect to quality and safety. And then finally, you have to track post-implementation, systematically fix your problems, especially those newly created. Inevitably, with implementation of any new system like this, you do uh, create new, new problems. Next slide. Well, thank you, David. And uh, as you might expect, we have quite a few questions. Uh, so sure. uh, give you a second there to take a deep breath, and we'll launch in. Um, we had uh, early on, and actually uh, sev at several points, uh, people 
asked a similar question. Uh, this is very basic, but just for clarity, uh, what is the difference between an interruptive and a non-interruptive alert? Sure. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. I should have made it clear. So an interruptive alert is one that is basically is like a pop-up and that you have to respond to before you, you do something else. A non-interruptive alert is an alert in which, uh, in which some information appears typically in a corner of the, the screen where you're working that says, for example, uh, looks like there's an interaction here. Uh, it's probably not a big, big thing, but it's something that you might want to be aware of. So, so uh, when something is interruptive, you have to you have to uh, proactively uh, address it. Thank you. Um, one interesting question. Uh, early on, you uh, you had uh, a lot of uh, text about the number of alerts uh, that were uh, that were rejected, especially for non-interrupted alerts. Do you have any data on when uh, providers? Uh, do reject alerts, how often or what percentage of the time they're correct in doing so versus incorrect in doing so? Yes, actually our, our, uh, our recent CERG uh, has, had a, has had a big focus on that. And most of the time when providers do reject an alert, they, they are correct in, in doing so. It's probably around 70-75% uh, of the time. It turns out it varies a great deal by uh, what domain you're talking about. So for example, for allergy alerts, most of the time when they override, they do so appropriately. For age and, and, uh, and kidney function related alerts, it's much less likely to be appropriate. Thank you. Um, there were several questions relating broadly to uh, user interface, and I'll try to uh, combine them a bit because we are, are running a bit low on time. Uh, but uh, the overall uh, want here, I think, is, is whether, number one, whether you actually have developed recommendations on user interface, such as colors and positioning and, and uh, so on, and also whether at any point you've worked with a UI firm or expert uh, to develop an interface that was felt to be most ideal. Yeah, so, so we, we have made a, a set of uh, recommendations around medication safety related um, alerts and uh, Shoba Van Salker is the first author on that paper and uh, it's published in Jamia. So that's one place to look at. Uh, in, in developing those recommendations, we worked with, uh, with some user from some human factors experts from the UK, uh, Judy Edworthy is, is uh, one of them and she's uh, an expert in in warning design in other industries outside of uh, outside of uh, of uh, um, in, you know medical informatics, um, um, you know we we uh, and and currently I've been been chairing the the uh, HIT uh, uh, implementation usability and safety work group, and we've had a, a whole whole group of uh, usability experts present to that group. There are many who are, who are in the work group, uh, which, which has just been great. I, I, you know, I personally have learned a good deal about usability. There's, uh, I would point anybody who wants to uh, learn more about this area to, to look at some of the materials from the presentations uh, to, that, to, that, uh, to that work group. Uh, you know, we have not made specific recommendations ourselves as to, as to uh, uh, for example, exactly what the us a, a user interface should be. There was some work done in the UK. Uh, um, There's called the Common User Interface uh, Project that w that was done that attempted to do that. Um, um, but you know that that's that uh, that uh, th those recommendations didn't really uh, go go that far. Um, you know, I, I do think it's a challenge. Uh, to figure out how, how we best get to uh, to better usability in the systems that we're using today. Um, currently, certification requires vendors to to uh, document that they've used some of the principles of user-centered design and designing their systems, and that's that's I think been a good thing, but it's uh, certainly not sufficient because the usability of the systems that we have today uh, really could be substantially better. And we're 
the, the, our, our work group is considering, you know, what recommendations could we make to, to get to a higher level of usability. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations or, or do you have you published recommendations with respect to uh, which clinicians which alerts should go to? So uh, in other words, are there some alerts that should be going to pharmacists versus physicians? And um, if so, are they identified? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question. Um, you know, and I, I personally believe that that um, um, we should be sending most alerts to, to physicians. Um, um, although uh, for for some areas, for example, um, you know, management of aminoglycosides, there's evidence that pharmacists do this uh, much better than physicians do, and. Uh, and I think we need to get to approaches that, that basically result in better medication management for, for um, uh, you know, certain, certain groups of medications and for certain medication processes. And, and basically, we need to work as a, as a, as a team. Um, some organizations have said, OK, well, for some levels of alerts that are not that important, we're going to send them to pharmacists. I've never really subscribed to that because I don't think we want to be facing, uh, basically wasting pharmacist time uh, either. All right. Um, another question, uh, this is actually a two-part question from one of our listeners. Has there been any discussion about standardizing the alerts so that every facility has the same understanding of high, medium, and low? I would think that consistency would be valuable and two, Will Shoba or others comment on the CERT NPRM within the list of drug uh, uh, DDIs? Excuse me, that should never occur. I think that's incredibly valuable and something that any certified EHR should demonstrate. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, gr uh, great point. Um, um, you know, there is not broad consensus about the the three levels and what those should be. I, I do think that that would be the sort of thing that would, could be quite valuable across uh, organizations. Um, um, you know, and in terms of the, the, the short list of the DDIs, I do think those should be in every, everybody's system uh, today. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Given the benefits and the risks of clinical decision support, especially if not deployed thoughtfully, should these systems implementations be standardized or at least normalized by regulations? So that's an interesting question and one that we've debated in our, our work group. And, and uh, I, I, I just don't see how you can. I think o ONC has done a really a, a terrific job of of sponsoring some work around best practices in in doing this, uh, um, and but you know I, I really think that 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 is uh, the, the the best sort of approach. And again, I would point people towards the safer guidelines, which I think are are really terrific. Uh, you know, Dean Siddig and Hardeep Singh, Joan Ash all contributed to those. Um, so I, I I think that's the 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 best sort of approach. Uh, for this, we're going to have more discussion about that in our work group later this year. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. Those, those were uh, it was a great presentation and great answers. Um, I think that we'll wrap it up here with the questions. And I know that uh, Jonathan had a few things that he wanted to say before we uh, ran out of time. So, uh, Jonathan, do you want to uh, step onto the stage and? Uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let's wrap it up as far as the presentation side goes. Great, thanks, Barry. Uh, this is Jonathan Wald again from RTI, and uh, first I just want to uh, thank the presenters uh, very much for uh, really a great uh, presentations and conversation, and thank Barry Blumenfeld for moderating. Um, our next in the series is coming up uh, on May eighth, uh, couple couple weeks. Um, we'll be getting the invitation out for that probably tomorrow, um, and you'll be able to go sign up for it um, at the www.healthitsafety.org website. Um, for anybody who registered and said they wanted to hear about future webinars, we'll also be sending an email out um, on that as well. And that will be focused on the area of um, errors in diagnosis and how health IT can improve safety 
um, around the process for um, making a diagnosis or for picking up a miss um, sometimes when uh, there are, there's diagnostic uncertainty. So I uh, would like to thank everybody and um, wish you all a good uh, rest of your day. Um, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.